Hello, I'm Josh. I'm a PhD student from UAF. Um, we're on board the RV Sekuliak doing some oceanographic research. Uh, next to me is Carmen, a marine tech uh, who works on the ship. Carmen, what are you working on? This is the CTD. It's the bread and butter of any research ship. That stands for conductivity, temperature, and depth. Uh, we measure a number of other parameters, though, like oxygen, photosynthetically available radi radiation, uh, light transmission. We can also take discrete water samples with these bottles here, and then we can further analyze those samples in the lab. And from this data, we can characterize the entire water column. Uh, we can also generate sound velocity profiles, upload those into our echo sounder and multi-beam systems, which just help us gather more precise data. Interesting. This is really fascinating. Thanks, Carmen. Sure. Okay, so now that the CTD is back on board, let's go outside and take a closer look at the deck operations. Safety is very important when you're out on deck on the Sekuliak. The required equipment is a hard hat to protect your head from things swinging around, a life vest in case you fall overboard, and steel-toed shoes in case you drop something heavy on your foot. It's also recommended that you wear uh, rain gear to protect yourself from any sort of mud that's coming around or water because you get splashed a lot on, on deck. Hey, Sarah, how are you? This is Sarah, an undergraduate researcher at UAF. An important part of this project is, is note-taking. Our scribe here, Sarah, has been writing down important details of our, our project. Sarah, what type of things are you writing down? Uh, so most of the things I write down are the, um, like the type of coring equipment we're using, the coordinates, what time we deploy, and what time we recover the coring equipment, and also stuff like tension on the winch equipment. Excellent. That's really interesting stuff. Thanks, Sarah. Keep it up. Thank you. Welcome to the back deck of the Sekuliak. While the CTD deployment was very exciting for us, what we're really interested in is collecting some sediment cores from the bottom of the Bering Sea. If you look over my shoulder, you can see a coring operation in progress. Let's go check it out. Hey, Sam. Sam is a coring te technician from Oregon State University. Sam, this thing looks like it should be on the moon. What exactly is going on here? This is our multi-core. I'm just finishing rigging it up. This contraption is good at getting the top layer of sediment to preserve the interface between the sediment and the seawater. And it goes down and it plugs up the mud. And then when it picks back up on the way up back up to the ship, it fires. It fires. <laughs> Just like that. And <laughs> picks up the mud. So in addition to using the multicore, there are several types of coring equipment we use on the ship. Next to me are Drew and Chris, coring technicians from Oregon State University. Hey you guys, what type of coring equipment do you have here? Well, this we can rig as actually a gravity core or a piston core. So if it's a gravity core, it's basically just a big pipe with a heavy weight on top. So on top, there's 4,000 pounds. So that's as much as like two cars or a baby mammoth. And we just lower that into the seafloor. Now at the bottom of it, there's a thing called a core catcher. So the mud can go in, uh, but can't come back out. But then up at the top, there's a valve. So as the seawater needs to go out to let the mud in, that opens up, and then when you pick it up, it shuts, puts its finger on top of a drinking straw. Same thing. Now, if that's not enough to get the mud in the tube, we rig it as a piston core. When we do that, it's gonna free fall into the seafloor the distance of 20 feet or two basketball hoops in one second. And on the inside of it, there's this piston that's going to slide all the way up the tube and turn it into like a big mud syringe. Whoa, that's really interesting, guys. This is really cool. I love this stuff. Thanks. Hey, Chris. Hey, Josh. Hey, this is Dr. Chris Mayo from UAF. He's a faculty member on, at the university. Chris, please tell us about this piece of coring equipment. All right. Well, you learned about the jumbo piston core and Big Bertha. Now, this is the vibracore. And the vibracore allows us to collect sediments in areas that there's more sand and small gravels. So it really opens up our toolbox a little bit more and allows us to get the mud and sand that we need. The vibracore works differently. Instead of plowing into the seafloor with 4,000 pounds of weight, the vibracore goes in slow and vibrates the pipe as it's entering the seafloor, allowing us to get cores that are around six meters long. That's really cool. Thanks, Chris. I appreciate it. Sure. See you, Josh. See ya. Hey, Sambit. Hi. So here we are in the Baltic room on the RV Sekuliak. It's a staging area between the back deck and the main lab. 
here we have Sambit, a uh, postdoc researcher at UAF. Sambit, what are you doing to this core liner? So uh, this is a core tube where we uh, take our sediment samples and now I'm leveling it. And so we are trying to make the sections in, in 150 centimeters internal. And I'm also leveling the static graphic top, which actually helps us to identify which is lying on the above and which is lying below of the static graphic sequence. That's really interesting. Thanks, Sam. I appreciate it. You're doing great Thank work. You. Thank you, Josh. So once we get our cores sliced, we take them over here and put them in the core cutter and we'll, we'll cut the cores in half lengthwise so we can split them open and see what's inside. Here we have Will, an undergraduate student at UAF, and Sarah, a, a master student at UAF. They're going to show us how to cut this core in half. So once this core is bisected lengthwise, we can open it up and see what uh, the sediment reveals. So once we've got it all split up into 150 centimeter sections, we feed each one of those into this pipe and saw it through straight down the middle, going through the pipe, but not the entire layer. We save that for this wonderful saw, which doesn't disturb the stratigraphy as much so that we can take it into the lab and look at it. This is going to make a lot of noise. So we have to wear ear protection and safety glasses. But me, I'm going to get out of here because I don't really like the noise. This is the wet lab on the RV Sekuliak. After we finish splitting the cores open in the Baltic room, we bring them in here for some further analysis. This is Sarah, the geoscience faculty at UAF. Sarah, what are you finding in these cores so far? So after the cores are split, we open them up here. And the first thing we do is sort of clean them off with something simple like this tool, a blank credit card. Uh, clean them off so that we can see the layers. And then we measure the depth in the core and describe all the layers with respect to grain size. Are they sandy, silky, muddy, and color? And by doing that, we can already start to reconstruct how the place where this sediment was deposited has changed over time because depth in the core correlates with age. The stuff on the bottom is the oldest and the layers get younger and younger and younger as you go to the top. Right now, we won't know exactly how old those layers were, but we're also looking for bits of organic matter like twigs or other plant fragments that we can send out for radiocarbon dating that will tell us how many hundreds or thousands of years old individual layers in the core are. Oh, that's really cool, Sarah. Thank you. This core is gorgeous, by the way. I love it. Lots of interesting layers going and lots of changes over time. And to my left here is Matt. He's a member of the College of Fisheries and Ocean Science at UAF. Matt, what are you finding over here? So what I'm doing right now is I'm sieving a small uh, sample from the bottom of this core. And uh, once we've sieved it, we put it under the microscope right here and take a look and see what we're seeing. And what, we're, what I'm seeing right now is a lot of mosses and small insect parts and other plant pieces that actually don't live in the marine environment. So they're all kind of pointing that uh, it's actually a freshwater or a terrestrial ecosystem, which is really exciting. This is very exciting, Matt, thank you. And now, to my left here is Ryan, a PhD student at UAF, just taking things a little, uh, looking at things on a little smaller scale. Ryan, what are you up to? I'm looking at smear slides, where we take a, a small amount of sediment from those cores and smear it across a microscope slide, where we then uh, will take and look at under um, high magnification, and we're identifying diatoms and pollen to see whether or not the depositional environment was freshwater or marine. This is really cool stuff, Ryan. Keep it up. I love it. Hey, Beth. So this is the main lab on the Sekuliak. Next to me is Beth Casey from the USGS. She is working with the uh, multi-sensor core logger. Beth, what's going on with this thing? So we, before we cut the cores, we take the cores in, we line them all up here on the table, dry them off, and we feed them through the scanner. Um, and the scanner, we've got a couple different sensors here. This one actually shoots a little bit of radiation through the core to figure out the density of the core. And then this one um, determines whether there's any magnetic minerals in there. And all this data comes up on the computer screen right as we're scanning it. And so we have access to that data right away to see what's happening in the cores and how they look different or similar to each other. This is so interesting. Thanks, Matt. The main lab on the Sekuliak serves multiple purposes for the science team. We store all the cores that need to be scanned on this table, they're staged here. This is where we have our meetings and we um, basically lounge here when, we're, when there's some downtime. We also have a ping pong table for our entertainment. Chris and Jenny, 
How are you guys doing? Good. We're good. having a good game here. Looks nice. Jenny, come on. You got this. So. It's hard when the ship moves. It is, fun. It is very hard when the ship moves. I am undefeated so far on this cruise, so I'll take all comers. On the wall here is our board of lives. This is where we have all our information for the day. You can access it via this camera in your room if you don't want to get up early. And the most important part of scientific research is good bookkeeping. Here we have a bank of computers for people to enter their data for the day after uh, logging cores. And we've got some people working on some research where to go in the future for future coring sites. We are now in the computer lab of the, on the Sekuliak where a lot of the geophysical stuff takes place. Next to me is Jenna from the USGS. Jenna, how are you? Good, thanks. What are you up to? Uh, so here in the computer lab, we have a lot of different sensors on this ship uh, that help us figure out the shape of the bottom um, and what's beneath the seafloor. So we use different things like multi-beam sonars, which allow us to map the depth of the ocean and figure out the shape. And then we also have different types of sonars and, and that use sound to map the layers of, of sediment beneath the seafloor. And with those, we can look for different features that we actually want to collect, collect sediment samples from. And that's what Sarah's looking at um, on the screen over here. She's going to show us some examples of what this looks like um, and what the kinds of features that we're looking for. One of our duties as, as scientists here on the ship is to keep watch of these screens for 24 hours a day. And we do it in shifts of four hours. And we basically look at this data here and we look for interesting features. Right now, it's really boring, but what we're looking for is stuff like this. This is a little basin that we cored just today and it has this like nice little U shape here and we're looking for features like that. Thanks Sarah, that's great. I appreciate it. And Jim, what are you doing over there? I see you're sitting at a computer as well. In addition to the sub-bottom profile uh, that Sarah spoke to, uh, we're also looking at a litany of other, other screens here uh, giving us a bunch of different information from chemical, um, in the underway data display to um, some weather. In front of me is the OLEX, which gives us kind of our heading or current position. And of course, above that, we have some of our multi-beam data, chirp, all the pretty colors up top. And up into my right is a few different camera views that we have, uh, along with some winch data uh, just above the OLEX here. This is Tony. He works for OSU as a technician. So how many winches are on board this ship? So there's these two in this room, and then there are hydraulic power packs, and then we have another really fancy winch behind us on the other side of that wall, a couple bulkheads away, and that's our traction winch. Or how many meters of cable do you usually carry on the ship? The traction winch, the standard layout there is 10,000 meters, so we can get to like full ocean depth, 5,000 meters, 4,000 meters, and then we still have enough left over to tow things. I love this room. This really speaks to me. Thank you, Tony. I appreciate it. Yeah, you bet. The Sekuliak also has a treadmill for those who want to stay in shape. Currently, the seas are uh, pretty high, so it's dangerous to, to run on this. And so I'll just keep standing here. Also downstairs is a, a complete gym for those who want to work out. And upstairs, we have a sauna next to the lounge. So the science crew on the Sekuliak works 24 hours a day. We have two 12-hour shifts, so we have to be extra quiet while we're in the hall here. Let's take a look inside of one of the staterooms. Hello, I'm Sochi, and this is the stateroom I share with Sam. This is my bed, and that's Sam's bed. And here we have a desk, and it has one of those um, nice anti-slip mats that the mess hall does. We also have a lot of cabinets to lock our stuff away, because things will obviously roll off on a ship. And a TV where we can switch between different cameras on the ship to know what's happening from the room. We also have our sink here, and um, the toilet and shower are inside this room which we share with the room next to us. We have to remember to lock both doors when coming in and unlock both doors when going out. So this is the lounge on the Sekuliak. We have a bunch of uh, recliners, lazy boys for people who want to come in and relax after a long day at work. We have a large screen TV. There's a, we have a book or library full of books and we have cases and cases of DVDs for us to watch for our entertainment in our, on our downtime. Here we get all of our meals served to us three times a day. We have breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and there's a fridge for snacks. Today we are having halibut chowder. All of our meals are prepared in-house. Everything is delicious. Uh, we have fresh fruit and vegetables, the whole cruise, and I've not gone hungry yet, and I think I'm gaining weight. There is a secret freezer that is full of ice cream. It's not really a secret because the ice cream supplies are dwindling rapidly. Um, I wish it was a secret because there are some big bopper ice cream sandwiches that are gone. Hey, Christoph. 
Hello. We're up on the bridge deck of the RBC Kuliak. This is the chief mate, Christoph. Christoph, how are you? I'm well, how are you doing? Oh, great, thank you. So, a few questions for you. We're up pretty high. How high are we? We are very high. We're up 50 feet above the water, and uh, we're four levels above the science labs. Interesting. Okay, yeah, that was quite the hike up the stairway. So, uh, what else do you see from up here? Uh, we get to see all kinds of things out these big windows. We're looking for ships and boats, other things that we might have to maneuver around. You get to see all sorts of animals up here. You get to see whales, dolphins, seals. When we're further high up north, we can see walruses and polar bears. I love the view up here. So, interesting question or weird question. I don't see one of those big old timey steering wheels. How do you drive the boat or the ship? Sorry. Right, we don't have a wheel because we don't have a rudder. Other ships will use a rudder to direct the water ah, okay. flow from the propellers. And instead, we have uh, azimuth thruster pods. Okay. which can spin all the way around 360 degrees. And we control those using our, what we call combinators right here. All right, Christoph, one last question for you. Can we please hear the whistle for the ship? Absolutely. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. That's yes. great. Okay, so that concludes our tour of the RV Sekuliak. I want to say thank you to the crew for uh, allowing us unlimited access to the ship and also to the science party for their <laughs> for their good spirits and letting me talk to them uh, while they were busy today. And I want to say thank you finally to JR and Natalie for their, their great work filming us today. This has been really fun. Now let's go back to the science crew for some Q&A.